Chapter 15. Been there, done that. The balcony doors burst open and Queen Red Riding Hood emerged from the castle. She was dressed in her best gown and was covered in her finest jewelry. Red always dressed to impress when speaking to her people. Fellow Hoodians, Red said and with raised arms. Thank you for joining me today. She glanced down her observers and was disappointed by the lack of it. attendance. Although the entire kingdom had been invited to hear the message from the queen, only a crowd of roughly two dozen had gathered outside, including two sheep and a goat. Red swallowed a pride and went on to her announcement. I'm assuming many people are too frightened to leave their homes, especially after the disappearance of our beloved wall. So please, pass this message along, Red said. However, challenging the current times may be, I have called you all here to encourage your strength and bravery. We have faced great threats in the past and have always overcome them together as a kingdom. As I look around at your faces, I can see that... Courage is in your eyes. The Enchantress may have taken our wall, but she will never take away our spirits. Red posed for applause, but no one was to accept. Furthermore, she continued, that there is one thing the people of the Red Riding Hood Kingdom know how to do, with the exception of the boy who cried wolf, is survive. Red caught her breath. She had forgotten the rest of her speech. What was that other point I was going to make, darling? The Red Queen. The young queen spoke out of the side of her mouth. Luckily for Red, Froggy was standing inside the castle, just on the other side of the balcony doors. We're going to with rebuild the wall, Froggy whispered to her. Oh yeah, that's right, thank you. Red said, then ready faced her people. We are going to rebuild our wall. Red struck another pose for a grandeur. This time she didn't continue until she heard clapping from the people below. Before we do that, I'd like to invite all the carpenters in the kingdom to my castle this afternoon to work on something else. I know it's short notice, but it would mean so much to me, she said. Thank you for joining me today, Hoodians. I wish you all peace and poverty. Prosperity, my dear, prosperity, Froggy corrected her. I mean peace and prosperity, Red declared, and then quickly went back inside the castle. As soon as the door shut behind Red began taking off her jewelry and passing it to her handsman. Tough crowd, she said with a sigh. At least I got all the queen words in there. The twins had been listening to Red's speech with Froggy. Queen words, Alex says? Yes, strength, bravery, courage, spirit. The four words essential to making a good speech as queen, Red said, and then quickly changed the subject. Have all the baskets and dresses been taken down to the courtyard yet? Yes, your majesty, the handmaiden said. The twins had awoken that morning, excited to see the castle's courtyard had been transformed into a workstation. Red servants piled thousands and thousands of baskets from her collection, and in one corner in the courtyard, and hundreds of her summer dresses in another. Jack had spent the entire night drawing up detailed plans of their flying ship. The blueprints were posted on the enormous board in the center of the courtyard for all to see. That to do it, Jack said with a huge yawn. How soon can we expect the builders? A few have already arrived, but the rest should be here by noon, Froggy said. Goliath scanned the courtyard. I think we have a problem, she said, and gestured to the pile of dresses. Who is supposed to make the ship and bl ship's balloon and sails? Alex and Connor looked at each other, each hoping the other would have an answer. Don't look at me, Connor said. I barely passed hope on economics. I almost set the school on fire pouring stereo, remember? I'm not very good with the needle, Alex said. Do you know of any good seamstresses in the kingdom? I've already asked Granny, Red said, happily charged into the kingdom courtyard. No one said a word at first, but they were all thinking the same thing. You're sure your grandmother is capable of stitching together a balloon and sail for a flying ship, dear? Froggy bravely asked. Of course she is, Red said, without a silver of doubt. Slipper doubt. The little old woman who manages the shoe and will be here later to work on it. They were delighted by the request. Granny's been making my clothes since I was a toddler. Trust me, if anyone know who can do it, it's her. Who can do it, who can... it's her. Within the hour, Red's Granny and the little old woman arrived at the castle with their needles and thread ready. Unlike Mother Goose, the ladies were exactly how twin the twins had always pictured them. 
They both had gray hair wrapped into tight buns on the top of their heads and reading glasses placed on the tips of their noses. The little one walked into a cane and Granny carried a large purse full of yarn and thread. Thank you so much for coming, Granny Red said, and hugged her grandma. No problem at all, sweetheart, Granny said. Her voice was soft, slow, and soothing. It's rather nice to take a break from retirement. We can only play cards and watch the grass grow for so many hours in a day before it gets tiresome. What? Little, the little one would ask loudly. Obviously, she is a little hard of hearing, and if the way she was squinting was any indication, she was also hard of seeing. Granny spoke directly to her here. I was telling Red we are so happy to be out of the shoe and Who's dead? The little old woman asked. Not dead. Red, my granddaughter, Granny said. Your granddaughter's dead? The old woman said again. Gasped. Granny turned back to Red. Don't mind her, sweetheart. She has more than 200 grandchildren. Her ears aren't what they used to be. Froggy, Goylocks, Jack, and the twins were growing more pessimistic by the second. Could these elderly hands been given such a daunting task? This is what we're trying to build, Red said, and showed the old woman the blueprints on the board. Do you think you'll be able to make it? <laughs> Let's see, Granny said, and pushed up your glasses for a better look. Looks like you got a balloon and sails of some kind, huh? You kids going on an adventure? It just so happens we are, Red said, with her head raised high. We're going to save the world. That's very nice, sweetheart, Granny said, and patted her on the back. She didn't seem too invested in what Red had to say, as if a little girl had told her she was going to the moon. Do you have fabric, or should I run to the shop? We should have everything we need here, Red said, and gestured the mount mountain to dress his pile in the corner. Well, look at you being thrifty, Granny said. She took one glance at the board, at the pile of dresses, and nodded, Yes, I think we'll manage just fine. Red jumped and clapped. The others looked more skeptical than ever. Are you positive you can manage, Jack said. Before he could get an answer, the old women had set themselves on stools near the pile of dresses and began ripping their seams apart. Oh, this is nothing, Granny said. Remember that summer you ballooned, Red? Poor dear, you gain so much weight ads and make your new clothes every week. The twins had to bite their fists to keep from laughing. Goylocks didn't even try to shield or chuckle. You don't say, Goylocks said with a sly smile. Red blushed a deep shade of her name. Granny, I don't think this is an appropriate time to... That's why I made her the red cloak she's so famous for, Granny said, obviously to her granddaughter's embarrassment. It was the only thing left that... She Better longer than a week, she used to show up to my house with empty baskets every time I fell ill. I never understood why her mother was sending them to me. Then I figured out Red was eating all the baked goods inside them. Um, her way to my house. No one in this courtyard could hide their laughter after hearing this. Even Froggy let a snicker escape. I was an emotional eater, Red declared in her own defense. I had a lot of things in my mind at the time. She unintentionally glanced towards Jack. Thankfully, you like my clothes. I grew out of that face. Yes, sweetheart, Granny said. We were all thankful for that, except for the fabric store. Granny, the little old woman, both read impressively long seams at the same time. The sound made Red cringe even more. Although it had been her idea, Red couldn't bear to watch her dresses be torn apart or to stick around for her granny to share any more embarrassing stories. If you all please excuse me, Red said, I had out to the courtyard. I think I'm going to lie down for a minute. My life has be suddenly became shaky fruit play. Word must have spread through the kingdom, because by noon the courtyard was filled with dozens of builders and carpenters alike, eager to help their young queen. The third little pig was the last to arrive, pulling a toolbox half his size behind him. I huffed, and I puffed, and I drugged. All of this way from home, he told the other. Seriously, right for being the red with queen red. Jack stood one on one of the larger baskets to address the room. Welcome and thank you all so much for coming. I'm afraid the task is large and our time is short, so forgive me for speaking hastily. The queen has put together a small mission in hopes of salvaging what's left of the enchantress after the enchantress's return. The mission involves a special ship, 
designed to sail across the clouds rather than the sea. And it must be built in record time. Jack walked across the room to the blueprints. If you could all gather around and take a look, Jack instructed. Our supplies are scarce, but I believe if we follow these plans precisely, we can build this in a matter of days. I won't lecture you with reasons to project what's remain in absolute secret. I only repeat that your involvement may finally free the world from the Enchantress's great grip. So if you all could be kind and lend us your labor, your strength, and your devotion, we can get started immediately and put a stop to this madness once and for all. Once the competitors, none of the carpenters objected. His words had encouragement, encouraged them past the point of the questioning. Half of them began stripping the baskets into usable pieces, while the others aligned them and started crafting them together to form the ship's bow. Jack was beaming. For the first time in a long time, he was taking charge of something productive. And he was a great leader. He's really good at this sort of thing, Alex said to Goyalocks. Quite good, Goyalox said with a bittersweet smile. He doesn't get many opportunities to be a hero anymore. Her face was full of pride, but as she watched him command the carpenters, the pride was replaced with guilt. Jack had been so much respected and valued member of Hoodian society. He threw it all away on his de decision to go on the run with her. Although Goylox knew it, it had been his own choice. She couldn't help but feel a bit responsible. Ouch! Connor shrieked, and he had joined the carpenters again, splinters as he stripped the baskets apart. How are you doing this so easily? The third little pig stayed silent, simply showed him his hooves. Gotcha, Connor said. I've always thought the homes were overrated. The day flew by as the carpenters worked tirelessly on the ship. Jack was growing anxious, knowing he was still he still had to track down the traveling tradesmen. He left Froggy and the third little pig in charge and overseeing construction after carefully going over his blueprints inch by inch. This is going to be better than imagined, Froggy said with the happy hop. What do you call this contraption? The third little pig rolled his eyes. That's a hammer, he said. So this is a hammer. Interesting, Froggy said and carefully examined it. Despite all that he had been through, he was still a prince at heart. On second thought, Maybe I shouldn't leave, Jackie said. They'll be fine, Goylox said, and started to drag Jack away from the carpenters. You're a terrific instructor. Goylox and Jack were stopped before they could leave the courtyard. You two, Red called down from an open window. She was holding a freshly opened white envelope in her hand. Take the twins with you. I just received word fairies are coming to expect our mission. Missing. Missing Juan, I don't want these two hanging around when they do. Oh man, Connor said, I was hoping to help with the ship. Then you should definitely leave, the, 30, the third little pig said, and yanked a piece of blanket off, basket off his hand. Very well, Goylock said. They can help us track down the traveling tradesmen. Alex Connor had to admit they were a bit excited to go on the hunt. What am I supposed to do to tell the fairies when they see all the construction going on, Red asked. Alex was quick to answer. Tell them you decided to combine your baskets into one big basket, she said. Red scrunched her forehead. Would anyone believe I would do something like that? Yes, the entire court here, said in unison. Even the carpenters and old women were in agreement. Red grunted. Fine, she said, and promptly shut the window behind her. We're going to need another horse that the twins are traveling with us, Goylock said. Not to worry, Froggy said. We have plenty of horses in the stable. You can have your pick of the lot. The twins eagerly ran up to the rooms and collected the things they thought they needed to searching for the traveling tradesmen. They met Jack and Goylocks in the castle stables, where they were busy packing supplies in the Goylocks' infamous cream-colored horse porridge. Porridge glanced uneasily at all the other horses. Goylocks hasn't been exaggerating. Her horse really didn't care for other horses. And as the twins also glanced around the perfectly groomed ponies, it wasn't hard to understand why. While Porridge had been out in the world running for the law with her mistress, all these horses had spent their days in their comfortable stalls. No wonder they didn't get along. Which horse should we take, Alex asked. Um, that one, Connor said, and pointed to a large brown stallion in the very back of the stables. 
Why that one, Hawks? That's because he's the only one that doesn't have bows on his mane. That's Buckle, the twins. The stable hand told the twins. Are you sure he want that one? He can be a tad aggressive. Connor did a lap around the stable to make sure. Positive, he said. All the other ones look like they belong in the doll aisle in the toy store. Suit yourself, the stable hand said. But don't say I didn't warn you. He threw the saddle on the, with the largest silver buckles on the twins had ever seen over the horse. Is that why you call him Buckle? Ag said. Partially, the stable hand said. <laughs> You'll see. A few minutes later, Jack, Goyalax, and the twins were off. Jack and Goyalax led the way on porridge while Alex Connor rode on Buckle a few yards behind them. It didn't take long to figure out why the horse had been given his name. He bucked aggressively every few feet and neighed loudly as he did. Clearly, the silver buckles on the saddle were the only fast or strong enough to keep the saddle on the horse. How do you turn this thing off? Connor yelled, clutching to the reins as hard as he could. I think I'm going to be sick, Alex said. Her arms were wrapped around her brother's ribs as tightly as possible without crushing them. Goylock steered Porridge around the face of Puckle. Porridge, tell the show off to stop, Goylock said to her horse. Porridge neighed disapprovingly at Buckle, and he stopped bucking immediately. Porridge rolled her eyes at Buckle. Buckle snorted at Porridge almost flirtatiously. Ooh. It made the twins a little uncomfortable, obviously. There was a history with the horses, a history they weren't interested in learning. The twins followed Porridge out of the Red Riding Hood Kingdom and into a forest resting along the Charming Kingdom and the Fairy Kingdom border. Jack and Goldilocks were extra weary. The Enchantress had turned the entire world into the Dwarf Forest. Before they knew it, nightfall has upon them, and they set up a small camp to the side of the path. Alex Connor laid out some blankets on the ground to sleep on. This discomfort is almost comforting, Connor said, once he stretched on the hard ground. I think I actually miss sleeping in strange forces. Get used to it, Alex told him. We've got a lot of adventure ahead of us. True, Connor said. But at least this time, we'll have friends. Unlike her brother, Alex couldn't sleep. After tossing the tourney, she got up and had a seat next to Goylox, who was sharpening her swords by a tiny campfire. She kept an eye out while the others slept. You're not like any other woman I've ever met, Alex told her. Why is that, Goylox asked. You're just so confident and self-sufficient, Alex said. So many girls, especially in my world, are so insecure and jealous. We rely on so much on one another, but we're so mean to each other at the same time. We could use more women like you to look up to. Goylox was sad to hear it. I was all those things once, she said. But, but after being on the run, I've learned a life spent creating enemies isn't worth leading. Having allies is the best advantage in the world. Jealousy is just a reminder of the frustrations you have with yourself. Who has time to only concern on that? Concentrate on that. Alex smiled. That's powerful, she said. I wish the girls at school could hear that. Brandon to school. Trust me, those girls will leave you alone, Goyalox said. No, I couldn't do that, Alex said. Violence is frowned upon in my world. It's not like that here. It's not needed. Alex liked the sound of that. Then find out what your sword is. Find your advantage and wear it proudly. Beat those girls at their own game by seeming perfectly content in your own life, she said. Then again... I'm a wanted fugitive, and I, and I may not be the best person to give advice. Alex laughed. It was some of the best advice she had ever been given, even if it was by a crook. Everyone was up by sunrise the following morning. To pass the time as they searched, Jack and Goylux told the twins all about their escape escapades over the last year on the lamb. I knew Goy could fight, but I had no idea of what a warrior she was, Jack said. There I was in the corner kingdom, surrounded by twenty soldiers. I had just been caught stealing a loaf of bread from a bakery. I didn't have my axe, a sword, or anything. I was helpless. Then, like a candy cannibal, Goldie and Porridge burst through the doors, and Goldie fought off all the soldiers single-handedly. No way, Connor said. He's embezzle. He's embellishing. There are only like a dozen soldiers. Goldie laughed, sitting in the modest shrug. Where did you learn to fight, Goldie laughed, Connor asked. And can you teach me? I've always wanted to be a good swordsman. 
When I was younger, I realized no one was going to fight for me. So I picked up a sword and taught myself, Glylock said. I can show you a few tricks if you like. Awesome, Connor said. I've got really good hand-eye coordination. I have the second highest score on Pac-Man at the arcade. Jack and Goldilocks had no idea if this was supposed to be impressive. Jack isn't so bad himself, you know, Goldilocks boosted. Once he saved me from a trio of ogres, I was tied above a large boiling cauldron. They would have had made a soup out of me if Jack hadn't gone there in time. Jack loud and indifferent laugh. I only distracted them long enough for you to untie the knots, he said. She took care of them once she was free. But it's the thought that counts, Goylock said and hugged his neck. The tradesman bound group traveled up and down every path. They found looking everywhere of any sign of him. He should be in this area, Jack said. It's where I found him as a kid. They call him the traveling tradesman, but he never goes far. Wait a second, Goylock said. She hopped off porch and scanned the dirt path. There are two sets of identical birds on the ground that stretch a good distance behind and ahead of them. What kind of birds walk this long, Goylock asked. Jack's eyes lit up. The twins didn't know what they were on, but they knew they were making progress. Goylock's remounted porch and their group charged down the path as fast as the horses could gallop, found the tracks of the forest ahead. The group eventually discovered an old covered wagon parked the side of the path. A small chimney poked down the wagon's roof. The wagon's mule was resting and tied to a nearby tree. Look at the tracks, Alex said and pointed in the ground. The bird tracks led right up to the back of the wagon. I had... It had bird feed shaped spurs around its wheels. The wagon was leaving bird friends as it traveled down the path. It was an incredibly clever way to cover one's tracks. Tradesman, Jack called out, is that you in there? All was silent at first. Then a hurried shuffle came from inside the wagon and rocked from side to side. The top half of the wagon's doors burst open. The traveling tradesman peeked outside. Are you a friend or a foe? the tradesman asked. He was an elderly man with a long gray beard, tattered clothing, and a wandering eye. He had aged a bit since the last time the twins saw him, but he was just as kooky as ever. Friends, Connor happily exclaimed. Old friends, actually. Do you remember us? Tradesmen studied their faces. My boy, I remember every trade I have ever made, the tradesman said. But my mind has grown weary in my old age, and the faces of Chach have been lost in my memory. Jack? Goldilocks and the twins climbed down from their horses and walked, walked closer so he could view them better. You helped us escape the Tron Goblin territory a year ago, Alex said. We met you in the dungeons and you traded your freedom for us, ours. You told us about the wishing spell. The tradesman stroked his beard, brushing crumbs off it. He must have been in the middle of a meal. Ah, yes, he said with one squinted eye. I do admit a small sparkling familiarity sweeping through me. I wish I had a memory of you, he said to Goldilocks, but you, I think I remember you, he said to Jack. It's been a long time since we were last face to face, Jack said. Perhaps you remember a lad you traded magic beans with in exchange for a cow. The tradesman's eyes mouth grew wide with delight. Well, I'll be darned as a legless goat, he said and clapped his hands together. If it isn't Jack, my favorite customer. Jack happily nodded up to him. It's me, old man, he said. It's good to see you again. Come on in, my boy, he said, and opened the lower half of the wagon door. I just made some pheasant pudding. He disappeared in the wagon. The others took that as their cue to follow him inside. The small wagon was very cramped. A bed was pushed in the back. A tiny table was in the center. And the interior was lined with cabinets and shelves and cages. Canteens, brooms, buckets, daggers, and more were displayed on the shelves in the cabinets. The twins knew the objects most likely held some given key value and were waiting to be traded. Geese, ducks, and pigs were locked in the cages. No doubt what the tradesman had profited from his recent trades. Have a seat, have a seat, the tradesman said. Jack and Jack Oilox and twins focused them forced themselves around the table. The tradesmen handed them each a plate of pheasant pudding, which was bits and pieces of unplugged birds floating in mysterious gravy and a loaf of stale bread. The twins had to hold their noses so they didn't become sick. So what brings you to my neck of the woods, old boy? The tradesman asked Jack with a pat on the back. 
We've been searching for you, actually, Jack said. And what do I owe you the honor of being the subject of such a quest, the tradesman said. Connor had to re replay his sentence in his head before he understood the tradesman was asking. Jack cautiously looked for the others before confessing. I was wondering if you had any more magic beans, he asked, like the ones you gave me as a boy. The tradesman's good eye darted around the room. He was honestly surprised by the request. Why would you need more magic beans, he said. Surely the first badge gave you enough adventure for a lifetime. Indeed they did, Jack said. It's not an adventure we're after, but a way to get to the giant's castle. The beanstalk has been removed, and you're hoping to grow another one. The tradesman's good eye studied each of their faces. But why would you need to revisit a giant's castle at a time like this, he asked. The group looked across the table at one another. Alex decided it didn't have time to beat around the bush and got straight to the point. Have you ever heard of the Wanda Wonderman, Alex asked. The Wanda Wonderman, the tradesman asked. Connor began to explain. It's a wand that you could build out of the six most prized possessions of the six most hated people in the world. Tradesman raised a hand to silence them. Young man, I know what the Wanda Wonderman is for n longer than you've been alive, he said. I just find it hard to comprehend why that would be at the top of your agenda, things being as they are. That's just the thing, Mr. Tradesman, if I may call you. Mr. Tradesman, Alex said. We're trying to build it so we can fix the things we are now. The ways things are now. We're trying to stop the Enchantress, and it's the only thing we know how. The wagon went silent. Everyone sat on edge, questioning Alex's de decision to blurt out the truth. Would spilling the beans get them closer to obtain magical ones? The tradesman sat back in his chair and stroked his beard, gazing back and forth between Alex and Connor. I remember you now, he said softly. I don't recall the exact whereabouts or whenabouts, but I do remember the faces of you two youngsters as on an extraordinary quest. They were so ambitious in their pursuit, but they were completely selfless in their attempt. It wasn't glory they were after, but harmony, rather. I decided to help them because I knew our paths would cross again one day. The twins didn't know what to say. His saving them had been such a kind gesture, it still humbled them. I guess your intuition was right, Connor said. Only now we're trying to save the world. The tradesman observed them for only a moment more. He stood up to one of the cabinets. He dug through it for a while, pulling out extremely chip shaped plates and goblets and tools and gadgets before finally removing a small brown bag. The tradesman poured the contents of the little bag into the table, and the twins found themselves staring down at three beans. They were round and wide like lima beans, but were black and bounced lively on the table. Magic beans, Jack said excitedly. You still have some. They're the last of my I have in my possession, the tradesman said. They aren't easy to come across either. Magic beans have been plucked from a plant that grows from ground fertilized by unicorn manure and watered by the tears of a witch. But they're my gift to you. Everyone sat to their seats. Are you sure, Goliath said. We were prepared to pay you. She pulled a handful of diamonds from out of the side of her boot. Goldie, where did you get those? I saw them from Red when she wasn't looking. She won't miss them, Goliath said. I was so you would have to make a trade of some kind. The tradesman scooped the beans up and back and hand the jack. Considered it my little contribution to the people brave enough to take on the evil enchantress, the tradesman said. That was easy, Connor said. He couldn't believe the luck they had so far. Maybe making this one won't be so difficult after all. There will be plenty of dangers to be found, I'm afraid, the tradesman said, especially when pursuing the wand of wonderment. I would know. I tried building it myself when I was a young man. You did? Alex asked, unable to contain her surprise. So does that mean it's real? Oh yes, it's very real, I can assure you, he told her. Much like the witching spell you were after previously, many fools had attempted to create themselves, but have died trying. It was during my own pursuit I became the tradesman you see today. I discovered selling trinkets of interest was more profitable than searching for them. Do you know what we should expect then? Connor asked. I can only imagine, the tradesman said. I just remember that... Even the tamest of places will surprise you with what is lurking in its shadows. And these beings are no exception. Although the giant is dead, there are still dangers waiting for you at his castle. 
Connor gulped loudly. Do you care to specify, he asked. Young man, if it was in my nature to be specific, I wouldn't be able to look in two directions at all times, the tradesman said. And as good I glared at Connor. Well, we can't thank you enough, Jack said. Kindness is a rare thing to come across in the forest. But it's I who should be thanking you, the tradesman said. After giving you those beans, my sales have went through the roof. You gave me my career, old boy. You always be like a son to me, Jack. Connor cleared his own throat. The kind of son you rip off in a trade that sends him on a life-threatening adventure, he asked. The tradesman rethought his words. More like a nephew, then, he said. He looked through the wagon door at the dark, darkening evening sky. Where did the time go? You must excuse me now. I must be off before Sunday, sunset. I never stay more than one day in one place. Sake of the trade. Sake of the name. He winked with his good eye, although none could figure out who he was. it was meant for. Good luck, my friends. Jack, Goldilocks, and Twins left the wagon and found their horses. The tradesman hitched up his mule and rode off into the forest. The sun began to set. The twins wondered what was very a very special circumstance would be required for them to cross paths with him again. What do you think he meant when he said there are other dangers waiting for us at the giant's castle, Connor asked. Giant didn't leave behind a crazy widow or anything, did he? It's been a long time since I was there, Jack said, climbing his stride porridge. The giant was the only terrifying thing I could find remember being in the castle. That, of course, in the golden harp singing. The twins and Goldilocks remounted their horses and rode off in the opposite direction of the tradesmen, heading back to the Red Riding Hood Kingdom. They rode the entire night and arrived the next afternoon and found amazing progress had been made on the flying ship. Red, Froggy, and the third little pig were huddled around the blueprints. Did you find the tradesmen? Froggy asked as soon as he saw them arrive. Connor held up the small bag of magic beans. Our first of hopefully many victories, he said. By the way, Froggy, after seeing what the guy ate, I'll never pick on you about Lily Patsy again. This looks incredible, Alex said. More than half the ship looks <laughs> looked ready. It should be complete by the day after tomorrow, Third Little Pig said. Jack was hesitant to give his own praise. It looks so much bigger than what my plan proposed, he said. Yes, yeah, about that, Froggy said with an apologetic thought. Queen Red made a few revisions to your plans, Third Little Pig said. Revisions? Jackson looked at Red. Well, I figure since I was going to be traveling with you, I would need my own chambers, Red said. Matter of factly, I added a lower deck for me and my things. But don't worry, there's plenty of room for you to rest on the upper deck. Jack sighed and rubbed his eyes. Goylocks looked like she was going to strangle someone. So the twins decided to excuse themselves before she did. They could hear Goylocks and Red arguing as they climbed the stairs of their bedrooms. The sun was beginning to set on the on another day, and the twins fell asleep the instant they made contact with their beds. They knew the days ahead would be difficult, but the Wand of Wonderment had finally been confirmed as a real tool of overthrowing the Enchantress, so they focused on that and let that triumphant feeling ease them to sleep. At an hour or so after midnight, Connor woke with a troubling sensation. He couldn't fight off the feeling he was being watched as he sleep. His eyes fluttered open, and as he slowly focused, his heart dropped. Standing at the foot of his bed, intently staring at him, was a woman. She was beautiful and transparent. She had long, flowing hair with a single rose behind her ear. She wore a long nightgown under a robe that was tied at the waist. Although Connor was certain he had never seen her before, she looked oddly familiar. Who... Who are you? Connor shuddered. Stuttered. The twin didn't respond. She glided up to the window and pointed the lamb in the distance. She looked back at him with a grave expression. What do you want? Connor muttered. The woman said nothing. She held her somber stare and slowly disappeared. Connor's jaw fell open. There is no denying it. He had just seen a ghost. Alright, that is the end of chapter 15. I hope you enjoyed the reading. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to hear more from the Land of Stories, The Enchantress Returns, and also more books in the future, because there will be plenty more reading in the future. So I hope you enjoyed today's reading, and hope you have a beautiful day.